If death is to be gain, Christ must be more precious to you than everything you leave behind. And when a person dies like that, the world looks on and says, this Christ must be valuable. I wish you life, man. Good morning, men. Um, we're going to continue our, our study today on uh, waste management and living the strategic life. Before we get started this morning, I'd like to spend a moment in prayer. Um, some of you made it, have heard yesterday that um, Sam Eads was uh, had an episode went into the hospital. I think maybe a, a stroke, bleeding on the brain. He's not been responsive, he's in ICU, and um, the, uh, the outlook is not good at this time, and so a lot more will be known today, but let's, let's pause and pray for, uh, pray for Sam, pray that the Lord will bless our time together this morning. So, Father in heaven, we do come to you this morning. We thank you for another day, for another uh, opportunity to glorify you today for the life and the breath that you've given us, and we know that our days are short on this earth. They're a vapor. And Lord, we pray today for our brother Sam and, and ask that you would be with him and his family. Lord, we pray for healing for him. And yet we also pray that your will would be done. And God, that he would magnify you, whether through life or through death. And we pray um, for Fran and for Josh and, um, and just for all the family, God, that you would be their peace and you would be their comfort strength and their strong tower during this time of difficulty. God, I pray today that as we study your word and, and study uh, a portion of your word that touches on this very thing, on, on giving a life to the glory of God, such that we don't even count our own life as gain, but we're willing to lose it for the sake of Jesus Christ, I, I pray that you would drive this home to our hearts this morning and that you would make us more Christ-like in our willingness to suffer and die, that you may look great in this world and the world may see your glory and your grace. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Our lesson today is magnifying Christ through pain and death. So we're going to be studying an uplifting topic. But uh, one, obviously, that's necessary if we're going to live the Christian life and to live it well. I want to start this morning with an article. This is kind of a, a lengthy article, but I felt like I needed to read the majority of it if we were going to, to get the flavor of what was being written about. The article is entitled this, What Are You Willing to Die For? And the article was by Matt Sanchez. It was written back in 2008 after some attacks by terrorists in Mumbai, India. But he says this, why should you in the United States care about what happens in some far off exotic city like Mumbai? The truth is, were the attacks in Mumbai, India to be reproduced in Manhattan, New York, or any other American city, they would have been just as successful. Roughly 10 young men, armed with semi-automatic weapons and grenades, went on a 60-hour killing spree that forced the world media to focus on the threat of terrorism. The terrorists brought along dried fruit and almonds to keep their energy up. These men were well-trained, well-informed, and used light inflatable boats to reach the Mumbai ports where they disembarked. Several Indian witnesses said they had noticed the strangely dressed and armed men and asked what they were doing. The gunman reportedly told them to mind their own business. More than two days later, over 175 were killed and twice as many were wounded. The men specifically targeted the Mumbai Chabad House, a Jewish uh, Lubavitch home where two Americans were reported to be tortured before execution. An infant escaped the same fate thanks to a courageous nanny. At the uh, CST uh, terminus, a, a major train station where thousands of everyday Indians were returning home, two terrorists opened fire and threw grenades. At least 10 people were killed. At the same time, two other terrorists held hostages, including several foreigners, at the renowned Taj Mahal Hotel. Since the attacks, the world has heard the tales of witnesses and the wounded who escaped the carnage 
But the truly amazing part of the Mumbai attacks was the reaction of the victims. Before the authorities arrived, no one attempted to challenge or stop the gunmen who were indiscriminately killed. There are several accounts of hotel guests cringing in darkened restaurants, hoping the terrorists would pass them by. At the Abaroy Trident Hotel, 40 hostages were held at gunpoint by only one gunman. I've yet to hear any tales of any of the hostages attempting to resist. Lascar E. Tabai, the terrorist group suspected of organizing the attacks, has promised to plant the flag of Islam in Tel Aviv, Delhi, and Washington. The gunmen responsible for the Mumbai massacre were willing to fight and die for their cause. What are we in the West, in the United States, willing to fight and die for? Global warming? Same-sex marriage or the next big sale at Walmart? The vicious attacks on Mumbai are a watershed moment that demonstrate the current asymmetric security situation. In Iraq or Afghanistan, what happened in Mumbai would not have lasted 60 minutes, much less 60 hours. Gunmen strolling down the streets of Baghdad would have become target practice for the many armed Iraqis. It is curious that Manhattan, a modern, wealthy city, is more vulnerable to a Mumbai-style assault than Baghdad, a war-recovering poorer capital. I hope there were men in Mumbai who stood up to the terrorists. If there were none, it pains me to recognize that the men of America may not have reacted differently. During the attacks at Virginia Tech, where one self-absorbed idiot killed almost two dozen people, the young men at that institution of higher learning all thought it was more intelligent to attempt to flee their classroom through the window or play dead rather than to stand up and fight. Only a senior citizen professor who had survived World War II attempted to block the path of that terrorist. He paid for his courage with his life. The others in the classroom died like sheep to the slaughter. The gunman student eventually killed himself, and Newsweek later ran the stories of the heroes who had survived the tragedy. For the many supporters of terrorism, the men who carried out the Mumbai massacres are to be celebrated as heroes and courageous martyrs. They will inspire others to fearlessly follow in their footsteps. What inspiration is there for those who oppose terrorism? War, therefore, is an act of violence to compel our opponent to fulfill our will, wrote the European war strategist Karl von Clausewitz in the 19th century. And although the Prussian general described a different type of conflict, the will to win will always be a necessary element for any type of victory. It just reminds us this morning, men, that there are people in the world who are willing to die for a cause people in the world who are willing to sacrifice and to give their life and not flinch at pain and death. And we have to ask ourselves as men, if we're going to live a strategic life, I think we have to ask the question, what are we willing to die for? What is important enough that we would give our very lives away, that we would suffer pain and death in order to see these things continue to flourish? Because whatever we're willing to die for, that is what we treasure, right? And whatever we treasure, that's where our heart is. We will suffer and we will die for things that we treasure. So what about liberty? Do you, do you treasure liberty enough that that would be something that you would fight and die for, that you'd be willing to suffer for? Give me liberty or give me death is the slogan, right? Independence, you, you value independence that you would stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with, your, with your brothers and, and defend something to the death, even though it might be a lost cause. Freedom, do you love freedom enough that you'd be willing to die for it? Uh, hopefully, hopefully men are willing to give their lives for these type of things. But increasingly it looks like there are fewer and fewer men who are willing to die for anything significant, as stories like this remind us from this news headline. What about family? Uh, hopefully most men would, if they had an attacker come into their home or they had a child snatched at the mall, would probably not give any regard to their body, right, in trying to defend their family or defend a child from some kind of 
attacker. What about honor? Do we love honor enough? Do we treasure it enough that we would be willing to die for it? That's, that's the interesting thing about Islam, is that I think most men who die as suicide bombers or attackers in Islam don't die so much because they love Allah or Muhammad or the religion that they're engulfed in, but that they love honor. They live in a society where honor and shame are so strong that they would rather die than to suffer the shame of not giving their lives for something. Uh, I played football when I was in high school, and I, mean, I will admit right up front, I didn't play football because I loved football. I, I liked football. I didn't love football. It wasn't, it wasn't the treasure that I, I went out to. It wasn't the reason I had multiple broken bones and things like that playing football. The reason I gave myself to football and had multiple broken bones is because I loved honor. And in a small town where I lived, if you played football, there was great honor in that. And that, that was the motivating factor by, behind what I did. It wasn't love of the game, it was love of the honor that came with the game and not wanting to suffer any kind of public embarrassment in a town like that. Uh, we see when a man's honor is compromised, he has to face public shame or embarrassment. Often suicide is a preferred route because honor is such an important element in our lives. We, we treasure it. But we want to we want to ask the question today: um, What what's so important that we are going to suffer and die for it? And we see in Philippians a great example of the Apostle Paul of what was important in his life. What what was that all-consuming passion that he had that he was saying, "I I would give everything for this." And we see that in Philippians chapter three and verse seven. Listen to what. Paul says here. He says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have sought, suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. You can almost sum this up, all that he's saying here, and really the whole book of Philippians, if you go back to Philippians 1.21, where he says, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. And you, you see here, even when Paul's talking about his life, he's, he's talking about this in, in economic terms. I mean, if you just look at, at verse 7, you see words like gain, uh, counted, loss. Uh, verse 8, count loss, value, um, suffered loss, I count them rubbish, I may gain Christ. He's, he's, he's using economic terms of what is valuable and what is important to him. Um, you may have remember the, the parable that Jesus tells about the, uh, the hidden treasure and the caustic pearl. I'll see if we have it on. There's the summary statement really for Paul. But uh, Matthew 13, 44 through 46 and we see that the kingdom of heaven is like a, a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and he hid again. And from joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. So we have, we have this picture of what, what is valuable, right? And, and the kingdom of heaven is, is so valuable that whatever we have is worth giving up that we may go and purchase it for something greater. And so you, you've got something over here in, in, in this parable. It's, it's all that he has. And he looks out and he sees a field. And in that field is a, is a treasure. And he looks at what he has. And he looks at that treasure. He looks at that pearl. And he says it's, 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 there's, it's so incomparable. It's so, such greater value than what I currently have that I'm willing to sell it all, that I might go get that because it's of, of the value there. For me to actually keep what I have here would be loss to miss out on what is over there. That's, that's how Paul viewed his relationship with Christ. If, if I keep my life and all this stuff that I love, 
and forsake Christ, I've lost, I've missed out on something that is truly valuable. In a lighthearted way, Jim Gaffigan, the, the comedian, he's, he's got a little bit that kind of makes, makes me laugh about fast food and how fat we're getting in America and those type of things. And one of the things he says is, you know, it's, it's hard not to get fat in America because, you know, they just make it so easy to eat fast food. You, you drive by McDonald's, right, and, and you've got the value menus and they're advertising a Big Mac for 99 cents, you know, and he says, I hate to lose money, you know, I mean, <laughs> you got you got to stop and buy that Big Mac, right? And uh, it, that's that's something that we look at it, we go, that's, that's such a great deal, that's so valuable, I'd, I'd be a fool to keep my 99 cents. I mean, look what I get for, for 99 cents. But it, it, in a much more important way, this is so valuable that if I don't give all that I have for it, then I've, I've lost out. I've lost money. I've, I've made a bad economic decision in the kingdom of God. And that's what, that's what Paul is, is saying to us. Um, we will give up something extremely valuable for something that is of much greater value. And our lives are valuable, right? Our lives are definitely valuable. But Paul's even saying, my life is, is, is nothing compared to what I have in Christ. I count all things as loss, and my life is part of that which I count as loss for the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. So I suffer the loss of all things. I've been willing to suffer the loss of my life. I count it the rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And so... What we want to understand today is when, when we're willing to die for something, when we're willing to suffer for something, what we're saying is we treasure that. We, we're making much of what we're willing to die for. We're exchanging value for greater value and therefore showing how valuable that greater value really is. We're declaring something to be better than life, whether it be liberty or honor or family. Whatever we die for, we, we are showing how much, how important it is and how much we treasure it. And so, um, whenever we treasure Christ, we truly treasure Him, we're going to be willing to die for Him. Now, there's a little interesting twist here. Um, pain, pain and death show how much we, we treasure Christ. But... I want, I want us to see that it's, it's not just that we treasure Christ, we, we magnify Jesus, we glorify Him with our lives, and because of that, it results in suffering. And, and Piper has a, a good a quote, a good example of this in the book, Don't Waste Your Life. He, he says this, he says, But suffering with Jesus on the Calvary Road of love is not merely the result of magnifying Christ, it is also the means. Not just the result of magnifying Christ, but it's also the means. And so we might look at it this way. 2 Timothy 3.12 would be an example of magnifying Christ, and then the result is pain and suffering and, and potentially death. 2 Timothy 3.12 says that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so... That's the result, right? What we're saying in that verse is, I live like Jesus in the world, and I magnify Him and glorify Him with my life, and the world sees that, and they hate it, and then there's repercussions, there's persecution, there's a result that comes about because of that. And we're saying something that's slightly more nuanced, that's summed up in Philippians 1.21 and, and Philippians chapter 3 of what Paul is saying here, which is that... Um, our, our actual, the actual means of magnifying Christ, or the, the vehicle for magnifying Christ, is pain and death. So it's not, we magnify Christ and the reaction from that is, is suffering because people hate us. But rather, God actually provides for us a stage, a backdrop, a vehicle by which we get to make Him look great and magnify Him. And the vehicle, the stage, the backdrop he does that through is pain and death. Um, I, 
When I was a young man, I went and was looking for some a loose diamond to buy my wife a, a, a diamond to have set into her engagement ring, and um, went to Wichita, Kansas, and met with a with a friend who knew a lot about diamonds, and we went and met a diamond dealer, and, and so he pulls out all the the diamonds, right, and, and displays them for me so that we can take out the loop and begin looking at them and, and choosing a diamond. And, and what does he lay out so that those diamonds become the brilliant diamonds that they are, so that I can actually evaluate and, and, and see in all their brilliance that color and that cut and that clarity and all those things begin to pop. You know, he's going to lay out the black, the black velvet, right, and, and, and put those diamonds on it. And all of a sudden, a diamond looks great, but that diamond looks absolutely brilliant on that black backdrop. And in the, the same way, pain, and suffering, and death is the stage, it's the vehicle, it's the black backdrop by which Jesus Christ looks absolutely brilliant in our lives. It's the backdrop where he pops for the world whenever we suffer for Him, and whenever we're willing to die for Him. Because what we're doing whenever we, whenever we suffer and whenever we die for Jesus is we're showing to the world that I've, I've looked at all I have, as Paul has, and I look at all that the world has to offer, and I look at pleasure, and I look at my own life, and all of those things, and then I look at the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, I see that, that treasure in that field and that pearl of great price, and I say, I count this as loss for the sake of gaining this. And Jesus Christ then is shown to the world that He is my all-surpassing, all-satisfying treasure. And that makes Him look great in the world. That's what, what Paul is saying when he says, for me to live as Christ, but for me to die is, is gain. <coughs> And the, the, world, the world thinks exactly opposite of that. For the world, their, their motto is this, for me to live is me, right? And for me to die is loss. And we're seeing exactly the opposite. For me to live is not me. For me to live is Christ, because I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I live. It's Christ who lives through me. And for me to die is not loss. For me to die is gain, because if I die, I get what I cherish most in life. And that is Jesus himself when I get to stand before him face to face. And he becomes my all in all. And the pleasures and joy that are at his right hand and in his presence become mine for all eternity. And so we, we demonstrate what we believe when we're willing to suffer and die for him. Something that I think we, we need to, to understand is if, if pain and death, suffering is the backdrop, the stage, the vehicle, the means by which we have an opportunity to make much of Jesus in the world. It's really the greatest way we make much of Jesus in the world. Then we are wasting our lives when we run from pain and death. If we have been created to glorify God, and God is, is most glorified in us when, when the black backdrop of suffering is behind us, then if we try to tear down that backdrop, if we try to tear down that stage and remove it and run from it, then we are, we are wasting our lives. We are wasting what we've been created for, which is to glorify Him. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 one through five. Uh, I don't have the entire verse up here, but Paul is describing to Timothy the kind of men that you're going to find in the last days. And, and here are some of the phrases he used to de describe some of the men you're going to find in the last days. Men that, that Timothy is expressly commanded to avoid. And these are the kind of men. Lovers of self. Lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. That's a scary verse 
when I read that. Because I know there are times in my life that that verse sounds a lot like me. And, and for me to live as Christ and to die as gain does not sound a lot like me. But what we have here are men who have, have looked at the cost and have looked at the treasure that Christ is and they've looked and evaluated pain and death and they say, I love myself and I love my money and I love my pleasure more than I love God. But I'm going to continue to hold to a form of godliness, right? I'm going to, I'm going to continue to go to church. I'm going to continue to have some religion in my life. So long as that religion doesn't encroach on any of these things that I love, I don't have to give up any of these things that I love and to show that, that God is my all-surpassing treasure. I'm going to hold on to these things. And so what they've done is they've denied the power of God, the power for God to rid them of their love of self and their love of pleasure and their love of money and to change their affections, to love Him for who He is and to, to actually give the power to, to suffer and to die for Him. They want to play with religion and, and Paul expressly commands Timothy, avoid such men as these. That's, that's a scary thought for us men. I think we need to heed that. <coughs> Something else I want to touch on just briefly is when we talk about a lesson like this and we talk about God actually ordaining, and it says multiple times in Scripture that we've been destined to suffer. Um, when we talk about pain and death and, and actually dying and suffering in order to make God look great, I think sometimes there's a tendency for us to think, isn't God... Isn't God a little self-absorbed? Isn't he maybe a little egotistical to make want us making much of him, and especially to make us wanting to make much of him through our pain and through our suffering? And in fact, I, I got that very question from a college student this week who texted me and asked me, Isn't isn't God a little self-absorbed? I mean, that's we're supposed to glorify God. Really, he wants us to all of life to be about him. And and you may be thinking that in your mind right now. I just I just want to say that, one, um, for a man to do that would be, he would be an egomaniac, right? If a man demanded that we make much of him, and especially that we would suffer and die for him in order to make much of him. For God, this, this isn't the case, and the reason why is because he's God. Um, if he is the most valuable thing in the world, if he is the all-surpassing treasure in the world, then he himself must make much of himself. He himself must treasure himself. If there's nothing higher than himself to treasure, then he must treasure himself, or he ceases to be God. He's not, he doesn't have the right affections and the right outlook on life if he doesn't value himself. Do you understand that? And so God, God must value himself. But the, the flip side of that is that I don't think I would want to call a God an egomaniac or egotistical who actually... <clears throat> endured pain and death and made much of you in order to free you from yourself that you might make much of him. Amen. And so we need, to, we need to keep the right perspective when we're thinking of these things. God has already done what he commands you to do and has made much of you in order to free you from yourself and enable you to make much of him. Moving on, I, I want us to understand, too, the great imbalance in all of this and God's provision. When I say the great imbalance, I mean the, the imbalance between suffering and pain and what we get in Christ. The, the imbalance between what we own and what we are willing to sell in order to go get out in the field that has the treasure or that pearl of great Christ. In other words, sometimes I think we may be tempted to think of, of Christ as maybe slightly better than what we currently have. I mean, my life's pretty good. I know Jesus is, I know Jesus is great, but well, when I weigh that out, I mean, it's, I know Jesus is better. I know that because I grew up in church and I went to Sunday school, but 
I've got, I've got some pretty good stuff over here. And I think we need to understand that what we're holding on to isn't even in the same ballpark with what Jesus is offering us. And if we don't understand that, I don't think we're willing to give it away and to suffer and to die for it if we don't see Him as being vastly greater than anything that we have. I mean, you don't, you don't sell everything you own and buy a pearl that's of slightly better value than what you currently own, right? I mean, you don't, you don't make huge economic decisions like that in order to, to make a little profit. I worked, I worked for a manufacturing company for a while, and uh, we, were, we were making cattle equipment, and I, I started doing some math on the cattle equipment that we were making, and we were, uh, we were running, we, we had like a 3 or 4% margin to make profit off of our cattle equipment. Some of the stuff we were making, we were making maybe like 2% profit on it. So we were literally spending $100,000 to make $2,000. You, you don't spend $100,000 to make $2,000. You know, I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. That's a, that's, a bad, that's a bad business decision. In the same way, you don't, you don't give up all of this over here to maybe get a little bit more, right? And we see in Scripture that what we're giving up, the great imbalance, is, is more than we could ever imagine. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4.17, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. It's not even, it's not even in the same ballpark. Look at, look at even the words he uses. Momentary versus eternal, right? That's, that's what we're dealing with here. Light affliction versus weighty glory that is to come. Not even, not even in the same ballpark, not even something that we can compare. He says almost the same thing in Romans 8.18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Do we see the great imbalance in what we get in Christ versus anything that we might have in this life. Even our own pleasure, even our own lives. Um, I want to stop and say this too. Sometimes I think we, we, don't want to, we don't want to put the dichotomy there that all of Christian life is suffering and, and we've got to get up, give up all pleasure in order to be a Christian and to live our lives. And if, if you've ever heard the, the great statement that was made in the, the, the Westminster Catechism that asks, what is the chief end of man? It says the chief end of man is to glorify God. And we've already said that we glorify God best, usually, through pain and suffering. But it also says that we're to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That God's, God's glory and our joy are not at odds with one another. God created us for pleasure. Uh, he says, in my right hand is fullness of joy, and my presence is, is pleasure forevermore. And so God, God wants us to enjoy Him. God wants us to have joy. He wants us to have pleasure. Paul, in this book of Philippians, where he's talking about living as Christ and dying and giving up everything for the surpassing value of, of Christ Jesus, he, he uses, joy is the theme of the book of Philippians. He uses it in 16 variations throughout the book. But what Paul has understood is that my joy and my pleasure are to be found in Christ. He is the source. He is the fount of all my joy and all of my pleasure. And even though I may suffer and even though I may die, I find joy and pleasure in doing that. You may recall Christ said that of himself. That as he looked to the cross, that it was for the joy set before him that he went and he endured the cross and he despised the shame and, and all that came with it because of the joy that was set before him. God is, not, God is not denying us of joy. God is trying to rid us of our trinkets so that we might understand what joy truly is and where pleasure truly is to be found. And so, instead of pursuing the pleasures of this world and, and all the things that it has to offer, we want to pursue the joy that only God can give. I like the way... Uh, C.S. Lewis said it. He said, uh, he said, we are half-hearted creatures. 
uh, fooling about with drink, and sex, and ambition, when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And that's what we're getting at here today, man, is that what, what God is, is, is wants in us, what we need to understand is that we are over here and we're making our mud pies and God is offering a holiday at the beach and we, we can't understand what that even means and so we continue to stay in the slum and to make the mud pies. And so there's the great imbalance of, of what God offers versus what we're continually wrapped up in, but there's also the provision of God to help us understand what we have and to see it for what it is, mud pies, and to understand what he's offering, which is that great holiday at the beach. Um, and so Philippians 2.13 says this, For it is, it, it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Philippians 1.6 speaks of the Paul's confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work and he will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That uh, Paul is telling us there's, there's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to make us love and to make us want what we ought to want, to open our eyes, to help us see, to rid us of these affections that we shouldn't have, to, to help us to turn from the mud pies and to embrace the holiday at the beach, to help us to see all that we have is worthless compared to the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, this treasure in the field, and this pearl of great price, so that we want what we ought to want. God, God can enable us to see the great imbalance and provides the provision and the power to view our lives as nothing and enable us to suffer and to die that he might look great. God can give that to us as a gift. In fact, Scripture speaks of suffering as that very thing. It is God's gift to us where we rid ourselves of self and we make much of him. And so let's close the day with, with this application. And that is, as we look at this, we think about pain and death and what that might be in our life, um, hopefully that would drive you to prayer as you think of, can, can I die? What am I willing to die for? Would I, would I die if I were faced with, with a decision of life and death and of, of glorifying Jesus in my body? And Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 Again, in the same context of all that Paul's talking about, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Go to Him in prayer, and, and the Lord will provide all that we need. He'll do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. He will he'll give us the ability to suffer well if we are truly His children. James 5.13 says it about as plainly as you can say it. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. I like how James says that. Not as, is anyone among you suffering? Um, maybe you should pray or you ought to pray. It's, you must pray. If you're suffering, you must pray. Uh, pressure, suffering and pressure puts us especially as men in do mode, right? Mm -hmm. whenever, whenever, whenever the pressure comes down, we go into do mode. We think more and more, what can I do to change the situation? And we're called to do just the opposite. Pressure should put us in prayer mode. And I confess, I can't tell you how many times that it's come down to a deadline or even preparing a, a talk like this morning and it's late at night, and things still aren't where I want them. And the, the tendency is, I need to stay up later, I need to work harder, I need to do, 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 when usually what I really need to do is just stop and pray. And ask for God's grace in my life, and for His power, and for His ability. Prayer 
produces that peace that becomes the guard of the garrison in our hearts and minds. And if we're going to suffer well, we must pray. And two, meditation. Uh, Philippians 4.8, just right after the verses we just read, Paul says this, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Nothing, nothing enables us to do what God calls us to do like being full of the Holy Spirit, full of His Word, full of His power because we've been meditating on Him. Uh, nothing cultivates hope like meditation. When we dwell on something, we start to long for it. When we meditate on Christ and we dwell on Christ, we start to long for Christ to the point where death all of a sudden is gain because for us, death is Christ. And so the more we meditate upon Jesus and gaze into his glory, the more we are enabled to have the hope that enables us to persevere and to suffer and to endure, even to the point of death. And so, for you today, man, what, what is of ultimate value in your life? What are you willing to die for? And is Jesus a part of that? Are you willing to suffer Him or are you willing to die for Him to make Him look great? Let me give you these discussion questions and then I'll close in prayer and we can be dismissed to small groups. But one of these discussion questions is, do you think men in America are less willing to die for meaningful things than previous generations? We opened with the, the article there where you saw uh, men not willing to die, not willing to sacrifice their lives even for their fellow men. Um, saw the, the attacks at Virginia Tech where really the only guy who was willing to stand up was an older gentleman who had served in World War II. Are, are we a generation coming up who are, are not willing to die, not willing to bleed in our leadership, not willing to suffer? Uh, I think that's an interesting question for us to discuss. Uh, have you ever suffered in such a way that you've seen the surpassing greatness of Christ? I'm sure there are men in here who could testify all day long of how their relationship with Jesus Christ went deeper and they knew him more and treasured him more in the midst of suffering. I, I'm pretty confident, Steve, you could probably give a testimony that some of the, the darkest days in your life of laying in a bed in ICU were some of the sweetest fellowship with Christ that you've probably had in your life. And we all can testify to those type of things. I'd, I'd love for you to share some of your testimony with one another. And then, does Philippians 121, Philippians 121, for me to live as Christ or to die as gain, does that describe you? Or is the passage out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, does that better describe you? The, the lover of self, lover of pleasure, um, rather than a lover of God. Uh, which, which, which is describing your life right now? And what can you do about that? Let's pray, man. We'll, we'll be dismissed to our small groups. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. God, would you please come and, and show us that great imbalance of what we're giving up for what we're gaining in Christ. And Lord, would you provide the power as we pray and seek your guidance, seek your strength, as we meditate upon the glories of Christ. I pray that it would change our affections and make us love Christ even to death that you might be magnified. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.